Hey, hey, welcome to Advancing AI, where we talk all things AI and machine learning. This is episode four of the Graph Rag series. Now, without further ado, I'm going to have Chris back on to talk us through episode four. Hey, Gavin. Hey, Chris. Uh, tell us, what are you going to be talking about in episode four, Chris? So in episode four, we're going to do a deep dive into a local lang chain implementation. Um, yeah, we've got some good stuff coming up. Should we go through this local lang chain notebook and look at what it can do and how it does it? Absolutely. So what it can do is take a bunch of documents, transform them into graph entities and upload them. We're doing that specifically by using Azure OpenAI. So we're using the exact same models that we were using before, but we're using the graph transformer and the Neo4j driver from LangChain. And a couple of other things to do some other things like prompt templating and parallel running of queries. So that's we've configured our login and we're using the exact same endpoints as before. So we're using our Azure implementation and the exact same database or instance of Aurora DB that we had in our Llama index, which I found was pretty good. You know, we can use yeah, cross compatible using Llama index or Langchain with your Neo4j database, which is all well and good. Um, we're going to set our Neo4j environment variables and initialize the graph driver. Yep. Here we're going to pass in some contracts, and I'm sure you're well aware of what these contracts are. They are around the agreement between Frodo, Sam, Gandalf at, it, within Lord of the Rings before they go away and defeat Sauron and destroy the ring. So everything they signed up when they did that, which I'm sure is, is a pretty big contract. If I was signing my, my life away, I'd want to know the, the the details of those and make sure I was getting the, the same deal as everybody else. Fair enough. And you can see that the text is being passed on to the, we're recording the text in. We are also going to just ping Neo4j, make sure that it's awake. It's not always yep. awake. Yeah, um, that's because pass... it scales to zero, right? Yeah, yeah. So the, the resource that we're using scales to zero just to yeah. save us money. In in the end of the day, we don't want it running running all the time. No. We only want to run it when we're either adding documents or querying the database. And if it can sit there, it can sit there. Okay. So this is where we're going to use our endpoint for Azure chat. Uh, this is where we're going to use our endpoint for Azure chat open AI. Yeah. And we're passing in those secrets that we're calling in. We're going to use that graph transformer that we described earlier. And we're going to convert those documents that we called in earlier. And then we're going to add them in. That's, that's all we're doing. Okay. I say that's all we're doing, but it takes about three minutes to run uh, and lots of prompts and responses. And we then pass those back into the graph database and save them. Now, this is where Langchain differs from other implementations that we've looked at so far, where we're explicitly defining our cipher queries against OrbDB, which is great for extensibility. But if you're new to cipher query, it can be a little bit tricky sometimes. Okay. But we've just ran, we just ran the query and we've limited it to 50 responses and we've visualized it, which is the interesting part. We all have a, a big, interesting graph. So here you can see that the fellowship is right at the center of all of this. And you can see that the forces of Sauron, Sauron himself, Boromir, Gimli, all of the entities that you would expect to be existing within Lord of the Rings, the different Gandalfs, all of the interesting things and how they all relate to each other. So you've got the One Ring, you've got the Kingdom of Gondor. And then because everything within the contract is related to the sponsor that's paying for all of this, there is one big sponsor right at the top. Yeah. Any questions on that before we move no, on? No, that, that's cool. I love the way that this is so visual in terms of the nodes and the entities and the relationship between the nodes and entities. That's really yeah, it, yeah. It's definitely um, it's a it's a good visualization tool. So the next part is where we do a hybrid search within that index. Sorry, within that graph database. So yeah. we, like we would with AI search, we want to perform a mixture of semantic similarity and vector embeddings to pull interesting chunks out of our database. So you can yeah. see that we're using a hybrid search and we're specifically looking at the documents and the text elements of those documents. 
and we're doing that within the Neo 4J driver from existing graph. You can, I think there's a method to do this with new graphs where you can create the graph from the documents you're passing, which is what we would have done previously when we also added those documents, but we've already got an existing graph, so we don't need yeah. to. Okay. So this, this shows a little bit more complexity. As we're going in, we're seeing more and more of this cycle graph popping up, which is new, new to me particularly. So that, that was a learning curve, learning all of this. And we're also setting some chat prompt, chat prompt, um, yeah. chat prompt templates that we're all well and used to from Langchain. Yeah. So you can see all of that interesting stuff. Here, we just want to check that we're doing this properly, that we are invoking the chain correctly, and we want to pull out specific information from our questions to pass to our cipher queries. So what are the locations of the con are these contracts based in? We want to know the locations, and we want to know the contracts. And these are the entities that we're going to be passing down to our cipher query further down the road. So this is where we set some more some helper functions to generate full text and structure that retriever. You can see that we are doing some more cipher query and SQL by the looks of it to define our outputs. So let's just move on to some more structured and unstructured data retrieval. So you can see that we want to know the document that's come from, and we want to join that to the unstructured data, and then we're going to return the final data. Cool. Langchain is pretty good. I'm sure you're well aware that we're implementing it for our normal RAG implementations for clients. Yeah. And yeah. we are doing that for a couple of reasons, mainly the extensibility and flexibility. So setting our custom prompts, doing that in serverless fashion, it's kind of one of the main reasons that we're doing it, but also chat history. So here we're setting some helper functions to set our chat history that we're going to call upon later down the road. And we're setting up the question answering chain. So we're passing our prompt, passing our large language model, our query. Yeah. And we're all returning it. So simply you do chain invoke and the question in a parameter and the question that you want to ask. We go away and send that because Neo4j is scaled to zero. It's waking up. It is waking up. Give it a couple more pings. There you go. Yeah. The contracts involved, the sponsor and the fellowship, which we saw within that node graph earlier. And here we can see that we've got some chat history that we want to use. So we've previously, I've previously asked it some questions. We've got some responses. If you're doing this in a more production manner, you just pass, pass them to variables and store them within cache as you go on. But there you go. This is how we're going to do it within the notebook. You can see our search query that if we were doing it in a production environment, we would log. So we can see some good explainability down the road when we come to talk to our stakeholders. But you can see asking, what dates are mentioned within these contracts, we can find four different dates and we can find the earliest completion time. And personally, if I was asking questions around these contracts, I would say, who's got the earliest exit time? Who can get out the earliest? Um, and we would want to find that out to make sure that we're all either exiting at the same time yeah. or we're all getting the fair pay for this. But yeah, that was a very quick overview. Um, very did you cool. want to go anything deeper and more specific? Well, so we, we, we've spoken about three different types of implementation. Now, in episode three, you spoke about Lamar Index and GraphRag. That was released by Microsoft. The question I have around the visualization is, can that can that visualization be applied to GraphRag and Lamar Index implementation as well, Chris? Yes, but it's a little bit more difficult and a little okay. bit more compl complicated than what we've showed you here. Yeah. The matter for the Microsoft implementation would be converting the parquet files that it creates and converting them into CVs and then uploading them into your chosen graph database um, yeah, in okay. the specific schema that they need to. Yeah. The Llama index, I'll be honest with you, I haven't found anything around visualizations for Llama index. I'm sure it's possible, but yeah. I haven't seen it yet. Okay. Okay. And I guess as well, not everybody would want that visualization aspect as well, right? So they've got an no. option. Yeah. Okay. So they've yeah. got options here in terms of. You know, whether it's a Llama index or Microsoft Graph Rag or Langchain implementation. Yeah, definitely. I would um I would say that the visualizations are great for this purpose of showing the capability and what yeah. Graph Rag is. But yeah. if we were moving this into a, a more production Rag. environment, I would just want the response and then store the logs somewhere. Yeah. So in terms of latency, um, what how would you rate the latency for those three different implementations? 
I'll I'll rank them one to three. Um, okay. I put Llama Index number one, okay. Langjing number two, and Graphrag number three. I will put Graphrag as number three because it's a local implementation. Right. It, I don't want to say should be in the cloud, but there's a solution accelerator that got released at the same time that deploys all of the infrastructure within the cloud. And this was super interesting, Chris. So thank you very much for showing how you use Langchain to implement Graphrag. Uh, I think that's thanks, it. That's it for episode four. No, brilliant. Cheers, Gabby. Catch you. See you later. See you.